morning. We got a lot to be thankful for this morning. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This vagabond. Turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. 
Hallelujah In the beginning 
nothing that he can't do and in that time when we need him the most he's right there he's right on time resting on us we rely on him he rests on us hallelujah is the spirit once moving over the water spirit come move over us come rest on Rest on us as the Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on
I think about um, in the book of Acts, they're in the upper room and they're praying. And they're seeking God. The Bible says they're in one accord. That one a Honda, guys. <laughs> they were in one accord, praying and seeking the face of God. And the Spirit of God rested on them. We need the Spirit of God in our lives. Because I can tell you there's enough of other spirits going on that sow discord, not one accord. That spirit of fear, that spirit of doubt, that, that spirit of frustration, that, that, that spirit of discouragement, that spirit of division, that spirit of confusion. You know when that comes into your life or in your midst, you know what you do? Because some of us don't know what to do. You raise a hallelujah. <laughs> you raise a hallelujah and you call on the name of Jesus. And you ask, Spirit of God, rest on me. You can see when somebody's sowing discord or sowing division or they're attacking me, you know what I want to do? I'm going to get you back. No, do you know how you blow their mind? I'm praying for you. I raise a hallelujah. I thank you, God, for freeing me. I thank you, God, for your peace. I thank you, God, for, for, for what you put in me. I thank you, God, for your healing. Raise a hallelujah for what you need today. And when you don't know what to do because maybe you're struggling or you're hurting, just call on the name of Jesus. Just call on the name of Jesus. And some of us need to do that today. Our response to the, to the junk of the world isn't fighting in a physical way. It's what the world would tell you to do. It's too much of that junk. It's not me against you. You have an enemy who wants to take your joy. He wants to steal it. You have an enemy who wants to destroy your dreams, destroy your relationships, kill your passion, kill your desires. When you invite the Holy Spirit, oh, he has to flee in the name of Jesus. And some of us need to do that today. Invite the Spirit of God to rest on you. And listen, don't just ask Him to rest on you. Rest in Him. Amen. Rest in Him. Focus on Him. You might have to dig a ditch. You might got to burn a plow. You might have to go get an empty jar. Uh, I'm going to tell you what we need. We need to empty ourselves of some junk so God can pour the oil, the Spirit of God in us so that we can do what he wants us to do. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you, God, for your presence today. Rest on us. And God, that we're not pushing you away. We're not fighting that. We allow you to rest on us and reside in us and teach us how to rest in you and depend upon you. Because our greatest need, our greatest desire that we have can absolutely become our greatest blessing when it drives us to depend upon you. We got to depend on you, God. And all this COVID stuff, all the sickness, all the folks who are struggling in their physical bodies, Father, we claim your healing, your word. You are Jehovah Rophi, our healer. We claim healing today. For those who are struggling with identity and want to know who they are, help them to know that they are a masterpiece in your eye. They are created and set apart, special, unique in their own way. Those God struggling with addiction and, and, and other things to know, you're a God who delivers and sets us free when we depend upon you. And God, in a world that seems so hopeless, you are our hope. We trust in you. For those students, for those teachers, for those heading back into the classroom and, and our school, we pray that your protection around them. We pray you watch over them. I pray, God, that Spirit of God move even in our schools, move in our home, move in our workplaces. 
because people are raising a hallelujah to you, because people are depending upon you, because people are trusting and hoping in you. And God, I pray now as our hearts, wow, you have plowed our hearts and you've tilled the soul of our hearts to prepare us for the word. God, that your word would go deep into our spirit and into our heart. And then we just talk about faith. God, we actually show our faith. And we begin to put our faith into practice. Oh, how you show your faithfulness to us. Show us your faithfulness, God. But before you do that, help us to take a step of faith. And we do that today, God. Equip us for this journey called life. And we'll know how to handle life situations in a godly way. I thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, what you're getting ready to do in our hearts and in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, why don't you greet somebody, smile at them, love on them, high five them, air hug them. Let them know they look good, even if they don't. Man, we're so glad that you're with us today. You took your time to be here. If you're online with us, thank you so much for showing up uh, for church and being a part. Uh, Share a comment with us. Share a like. Uh, Let somebody know uh, that you're worshiping with us. You can invite online. You can invite uh, here in person. Um, And we just hope you have the most awesome experience that you could possibly have. Uh, that you would encounter Jesus. That, that's, what it, that's what it's all about. You would encounter uh, a Savior. Uh, so, so we're glad you're here. If, if it's your first time, uh, if you don't know us, we're Pastors Andy and Terry Schaefer, and, uh, and, and we just pray for you every day, and we pray that God would move uh, in your life. If it's your first or second time with us, they're in the seat back in front of you. Unless you're on the front row, then it's behind you. Uh, there is a Connect card. It looks just like what you see on the screen right there. Uh, it's your way to communicate with us and, and connect with us, one of the ways you can is share uh, as much information with us as, as, you, as you feel comfortable, especially your name and email address. If it's your first time, uh, stop by the tent on the way out if you haven't already and pick up a gift. Um, if you give us your address, you might just get a gift in the mail. Uh, so, so we'd love uh, to keep you updated on what's going here at the journey. And, and you can do that best through our journey app. And by the way, if you're online, it's a digital connect card, not a physical connect card. So make sure uh, you complete that for us. And and yes, you too will get a a gift in the mail if you share your address, because we don't know where you are out there in virtual world somewhere. So we want to make sure you uh, get that. So uh, what was I just saying? The journey app. Yes, the journey app is, is easy to download on your phone. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And so uh, on there, you're going to find all the things that we've got going on here at the journey. You can even have the sermon notes and, and, and all that's happening. And you'll find out if you look on there, uh, not just ways to get connected, but things that uh, you can do to take that step of faith. Uh, for example, the last few weeks we've been collecting school supplies. We're going to continue to do that through next Sunday. Our students and teachers are going back to school, and we want to we want to bless those or help those maybe uh, who, who struggle in that area and maybe uh, can't afford that. We want to be able to bless them and give to them. There's a list of items here that you can see, and if you forget that or don't know, just bring something that we can can uh, deliver and give to those uh, who have needs. The counselors at the different schools that we have contact with and principals know exactly who needs it, and we're going to make sure uh, they get that the following week. You'll also see on there that our students, middle school and high school, are having a back-to-school kickoff uh, next Sunday, so we don't want you to miss that. And this is chronological age, uh, middle school, high school, not mental age. I had to remind him he couldn't go. Yeah, because I want to come for... Pizza and fun and games, and he want to go. It's middle school and high school, though. I want to come for pizza and games, but I'm not allowed. I've been uh, told I can't can't come. (laughs) But if you're in middle school or high school, you can surely do that. Bring a friend. And we want you to be here. And so... Uh, we just appreciate your giving because when you give, whether that's monetarily, whether it's through a school supply, whether whatever that may be, uh, we just had a food outreach Friday, and we're just uh, so grateful that we can bless folk in our community and bless you uh, as well. Uh, we can't do that. It's not possible without 
you're given. So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. You see on the screen the different ways that you can give. If you're here on campus, there are baskets at the back on your way out. If you're online, you can give online. Or even if you're here, hey, you might miss the basket, but you can give on your phone even while you're, while you're here. You can mail it in. There's so many different ways um, that we can uh, reach people, change people live, uh, all because you give. So anybody ready for the word today? And you have a treat as we finish this teaching. Pastor Terry is going to bring you a word. I think it's going to make you float, maybe. I don't know. Check it out. I mean, the Word has the power to change our lives. I like that. Guys, I'm so glad that you joined us today. Uh, we're going to finish up our teaching on Ridiculous Faith, where we've been learning to take next steps of faith, to learn how to grow our faith, to, um, to strengthen it, to elevate it. And if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about burning plows. Burning plows. I think Pastor Andy joked and said burning cows and plows. But if you remember, it was Elijah was the teacher and Elisha was the student. He wanted a double portion of what Elisha had. And so he said, he kind of accepted that call and he said, I'll do whatever it takes to be able to be your student, to be able to follow God. And so he literally, he was a farmer. And so literally he burned his oxen or sacrificed them and, and, and burned the plows and had a big cookout is what we said a few weeks ago to celebrate the fact that he was willing to give up things in his life to follow God. Then a couple weeks ago, we talked about digging ditches. And if you remember that message uh, with digging ditches, the, um, the army of Israel, they were in, uh, and several of them actually, but they were in the desert and they had no water and they were thirsty and their, their animals were thirsty and the soldiers. And so basically they cried out and said, we need water. And so God showed them that they needed, and remember, they're in the desert. They need to dig ditches in the desert. Then he would provide the rain. And that's exactly what he did. But they had to act on that first. They had to dig the ditches first. And then last week, we talked about gathering jars. Remember, it was the widow. Her husband had passed, and she had her and her sons, and they had some debt, and to, some, some debt to pay, and she didn't have any way to pay them. Remember, women were not, um, did not have that ability to, or did not have that opportunity to um, get jobs or pay in that day and time. So anyways, um, so she cried out to Elisha, and he said, well, what do you have? And she said, I have a little jar of oil. And he said, that's right, that was enough. So he said, go outside, collect all the empty jars that you can, bring them inside, shut the door. In other words, turn your back on the world where I'm getting ready to work in your life. He said, and start filling those jars one by one. And the miracle in that was she only had this much to start with. And each little jar that she filled on and on until she ran out of empty jars. And um, then, you know, he said, basically, because remember, olive oil was very valuable. He said, basically, go sell that, pay your debt, and live off the rest. Our God is a God of provision, of miracle. So today, guys, we're going to talk about one of the strangest miracles in the Bible, actually. But before we do that, let me ask you a question. How many of you are always losing things? Or maybe I should say misplacing them. Anybody? Anybody? You know, I, I, I said, I told the first service, do y'all hear that? I pinged my phone. It's the best invention ever that a watch, you can mash the button and it'll tell you where your phone is because <laughs> I'm forever losing my phone or laying it down. Or I don't know about you guys, but sometimes like I'll be walking around. Has anybody seen my glasses? I'm blind. I need my glasses. And they're like, they're on your head. Been that, done that a lot. Or, you know, I have been known to, to um, you know, my husband can attest to this, that uh, leave my purse somewhere, maybe in a restaurant or a movie theater or somewhere like that. So uh, please tell me I'm not the only one that does this. Anybody else ever misplace anything or 
lose anything. I see a few, I see a few honest people out there. There you go. <laughs> We're misplacing things. We lose things sometimes. Um, we have a lot on our mind. But what I want to talk to you today, guys, what I want to talk to you today um, is much more serious than losing your phone or your glasses or your purse. It's about losing your passion for God. It's about losing your passion for the things of God. And, you know, we just had a wonderful worship service, and so we appreciate that. But there might be a time in your life when you might say, oh, I, I can relate to that. There was a time in my life, I'm a believer, but I've seen a, a season of life perhaps where I lost my joy, where I struggled with my faith, where, you know, I didn't even have a desire to pray anymore. So I don't know if any of you have ever, if you, you, some of you might even be there right now. I mean, COVID did a number on a lot of us, right? Uh, but sometimes we just struggle in our faith, and uh, we can definitely not have ridiculous faith that we talked about. So we're going to finish this teaching on Elisha today. Um, we're going to talk about getting our passion back, uh, and we're going to look at this crazy miracle in the Bible. Uh, if you remember, Elisha was uh, originally, he was the student. Elijah was a teacher. Um, but this part of the story, where we are now in the scriptures, Elisha becomes a teacher. And he is mentoring other young prophets, people who are wanting to learn from him and to learn the ways of the Lord. It's a wonderful model to follow, guys. It's like that multiplication. You know, he learned something, and then he's going to teach it to him, and he's going to teach it to her, and, and it just spreads the word. What a great thing for us to do as believers. Right? But anyways, um, in this particular scripture, one of these students had borrowed an axe head, and he was dropping down a tree, chopping down the tree, and the axe head, the end of the axe, flew off. It went in the water, and Elisha took a stick, and he threw it, and the axe head floated. And this young man was like, wow, like, wh how did that happen? So before we go any further, I just want to tell you, I myself have a little bit of experience in slinging axes. Yes. So our family, I don't know if you guys have ever been to one of these uh, places, but there's a place, there's these different places you can go, and it's really axe throwing. You really throw an axe. In fact, Johnny, show that. I've got proof. I've got proof that I did this. <laughs> Where'd you hit it at, Shug? Where'd you hit it at? I just hit it. I heard it. One time, do that every single time. All right. Yeah. Good job, Mook. Oh, a don't look at that one. I missed. Hey. And in reality, guys, the axe head really does fall off. Look at this picture. This is our Megan. She slung hers, and the axe literally, it, it separated. It, it, it broke. So it really does happen in real life. But, you know, you guys may say, what in the world has that got to do with me? Why are you speaking on that today? So I want to give you a couple of thoughts before we get more into the Scripture. First of all, iron, you know, the axe head was made of iron. It was very valuable in those days. I would think it would to be very expensive, right? And this young man, he was studying uh, in the school of ministry, basically. I would think, well, I don't know, but I would think he's not a millionaire, right? Most students, do y'all remember being in school? And, uh, you know, I can remember, it has been many years, but I can remember peanut butter and jelly and ramen noodles. And uh, who knows, he may have been trying to pay off some student loans. The Bible doesn't tell us if college back then had student loans. But I remember what it was like to be a poor college kid, right? And the fact that he had lost something very valuable. In fact, um, my parents should be watching on our online church today. Hello, Nan and Papa. But I can remember when we were in school, we had just been, I had another year or two left. And inevitably, every time we go to mom and dad's house, they would have a bag of quarters for me. Now, I think they said they found them under the couch or in the laundry. I think they just went to the bank. That was their way of, of helping. But it fit right into the, the machine, the, the uh, snack machine, vending machine, and get a pack of nabs and a Diet Coke, and I was good for the rest of the day. So what has that got to do with us? Um, you know, he, he threw this axe head. He, he was gone, this kid did, and he, he knew he couldn't pay back. 
and he had lost it, but it tells me that God cares about the little things in our life. Not just the big things. He cares about the little things in our life. He cares about students. You're going back to school in a couple weeks or next week, and you might be going into a new school or a new situation. You might be kind of anxious about that. God cares about that. He wants you to bring your cares to him. He cares about if you have maybe a headache, not just the really, really serious things that need a miracle, but God cares about the little things. He cares if you got up this morning and your car wouldn't stop, start. He cares. He cares if you couldn't sleep last night or I don't know about you guys, but I can remember little things like um, when our children were small and, and we'd go, I'd go to the grocery store and I had three like stepping stone of children, you know, and to get them in and out of the car and to the grocery store was a big deal for me and um, to be safely. And this was, this was before grocery pickup when you could just order online and they'd load your car. That's wonderful now. But back then you couldn't do that. So I would drive around and I would pray, earnestly pray, God, you got to open up a spot for me. Open up a spot up close where I could just get the kids out and walk in or even at least buy a cart return. And time after time, God was faithful. He would open up those parking places. Guys, don't ever think that God doesn't care. Go to him with even the little things in your life. So if you remember Elisha, remember he is mentoring this next generation of of young prophets and he had built a school and the school had gotten really full, which is a good problem to have, right? But they were were getting, needing to build a new school. So this is where we pick up today in 2 Kings chapter 6, 1 through 7. So If you have your Bibles with us, get them out. I don't know about you guys. I I love, I'm thankful for my app. I'm thankful for my my Bible app and and the Journey app and and up on the screen. But there's something about having that Bible that you can touch and highlight and write notes in and years later go back to see how God spoke to you. But we're in 2 Kings chapter 6, 1 through 7. And it said this, it says this, the company of the prophets said to Elisha. So the company of the prophets, we're talking about the students here. Okay, so the company of the prophets said to Elisha, look, the place where we meet you is just too small for us. In other words, he's saying, it's time to start a building campaign. We got to do something different. He said, let us go to the Jordan. And what he means by that, if you study some, what I've read, Palestine back in that time didn't have a lot of trees, but the Jordan Valley The Jordan River was plentiful with trees. So this young college student said, let's go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, Elisha said, go. And one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha said, replied. And he went with them. And they went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. And as one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head, iron, remember it was valuable, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he said, oh no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. In other words, this young college kid, this young prophet was saying, oh no, I've just lost something that's very valuable, and I don't have the resources to find it, to to pay it back, I'm sure was what was going through his mind. But he said, it was borrowed. And the man of God asked, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, because remember, it's iron. Does iron usually float? No, it would just drop into what the anchor is made for boats and things, iron. But it says, when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and he threw it there. And he made the iron float. So the iron came back up. And he said, lift it out. Say that with me. Lift it out. And then the man reached out his hand and he took it. You see, guys, not only does God care about the little things in our life, but I hope you'll you'll listen to this big idea and never forget this. This is the big idea for today. God knows how to help you find what you didn't mean to lose. I'm going to say that again. For those of you online, maybe those in your back, listen to this. God knows how to help you find what you didn't 
mean to lose? Sometimes we didn't even know that we lost it, right? So as we begin talking about this axe head and we kind of dive into this scripture a little bit more, I want you to think of it as being symbolic of your relationship with Christ, of your spiritual edge, your passion for Him. And I want to show you how this simple passage, a miracle about a college kid losing an axe, uh, how can it apply to us spiritually? So I want us to start with this question. How did you lose it? How have you lost your spiritual edge or your spiritual passion? Okay, some of you might say, and then I saw you worshiping this morning and I, I, I raise a hallelujah with you. Man, that's good stuff. Some of you might say, I haven't lost my passion. I'm on fire for God. And that is a good place to be. We, we need that. And that, that, that I'm sure just is is pleasing to the Father. And we celebrate you as, as, as your pastors. We celebrate with you and we say, join our team. We need you here each and every week, right? So that the, the more that we can um, to praise and to worship Him and have passion for the lost and changing people's lives. So if that is you, I'm going to ask you right now to start praying. Start praying for those around you who, do, who are in a different place who have lost their, their passion. And I think if we're honest, I think it would be safe to say most of us believers have been there before, if not now. You may be there now. But if, if not, if you're in a good place now spiritually, you may remember a time when, you know, you were not excited about God's Word or not excited about the things of Him. So ask yourself this morning, how did it happen how did I get to the place where I am, where I have lost my passion? You know, maybe, maybe in the past, you were in a, a group of believers, a community. Maybe it was a small group, an online group, or whatever, a, other believers. And you poured into each other's life. I mean, I know our 421 group of girls, um, a small group we had, uh, we, we would have this group message. And we would always, almost every day, somebody would post a scripture a quote, a link to a video, or a song that they had heard. Maybe they were, had a prayer request. They were going through something, and they would put it in that community, and we would build each other up. We would encourage each other up, right? So, and, and that togetherness really helped kind of launch us forward in our faith. But maybe you say, well, I remember that, but that's not where I am now. For whatever reason, I'm not. Did, did I stop going? Did, you know, when COVID hit, man, things changed a lot. But you, you remember what it was like. Maybe you can say, in the past, I used to be on a surf team at church. Like, I, it was the thrill of my life to know that God was using little old me to help something much bigger than I am, to change lives. Maybe you remember when you were serving that you had this thought of, I remember what it was like when I drove onto campus for the first time, and, and I was nervous. Like, you, you think, I, you know, a new place, new people, like, I, it gave me anxiety. But when you drove onto the lot, you saw those guys out there holding those signs that said, you belong here, or welcome home, or um, you, maybe it was raining and, and you got out of the car and somebody held the umbrella for you, or a big smile on their face, and it did make a difference in your life. And you said, or, or, or remember, it brought you joy. You remember that, but you said, I'm not doing it anymore. Or maybe you remember what it was like when, when, when you first started coming, perhaps, and you had small children, and somebody watched and loved on your baby in the nursery. Or in Journey Kids, like they were, you knew that your children were safe, they were being taken care of, and they were being taught about the Father. And it gave you the opportunity to come in here with no distractions, and to be able to worship and to praise Him. And that made a big difference in your life. And you had said, I want to do the same thing for somebody else. So at one point, you were on a surf team or you were doing something like that. Guys, we are the closest to Jesus. Now, let me rephrase say that. I'll, let me rephrase that. We are very much like Jesus when we serve. Matthew 20, 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but He came to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. He was at that sacrificial level of giving where it's not all about me. It's about helping somebody else. And when you get to that spot, that gives you joy. 
So you may say, I'm, I'm not there now for whatever reason. I'm not. Maybe you say, I used to pray all the time. I did have my morning devotion, but also it was like a 24-7 prayer. Like, and I don't mean like going around like this. I'm saying you walked and talked with the Father, right? Like when you're driving, you're, you're praying for that parking place or, or you're in a conversation and you say, Holy Spirit, give me words to say to help this person. You had a close relationship with Jesus. And now you might be like, I don't even pray anymore. In fact, I can't remember the last time I did pray. Unless maybe I was saying the blessing if somebody was watching me in public. Mm. Or maybe you remember what, how much joy it brought you to be able to share your faith with others about what Jesus had done for you and you shared it with them and you saw lives being changed. But now you can't even remember the last time you even had a conversation with Jesus in it. Maybe it was, um, you remember when you, you usually really valued God's standards in your life, and you were trying so hard to live a life that was set apart, and you won't, didn't want to be a stumbling block to other people. You wanted other people to look at you and say, because the Word says they'll know us by our fruit, right? And they didn't have to ask if you were a Christian, because they knew that you were by your actions. But now, you might say, that's not me. I'm more like the world than I am the Word. So, and you say, how did it happen? How did it happen? Maybe, I, I don't know, may, maybe you got in with the wrong group of folks or something, and they said, come on, it'll be easy. You know, come on, let's do this. And maybe you did it the first time, and man, it hurt your heart to know that you were breaking the Father's heart, that you knew that this was not making Him happy. But then you did it again, and it didn't hurt so bad that time. And you did it again. And then before you know it, you're in this routine or you're, you're doing things that you know you shouldn't. It doesn't even bother you anymore because you've lost your passion for God and for things of God. It's kind of like, ladies, I don't know about you, but I love shoes. Any other ladies love shoes and purses? I see a few hands go up there. But it's kind of like, ladies, when we get a new pair of shoes, and we wear them for the first time. Maybe they're ballet flats or something. And, um, and you get this blisters on the back of your heel, and they hurt really bad. And you're asking everybody, can I have a Band-Aid? Can I have some Neosporin, something to, to help it? Like it's hurting, right? Um, and then the next time you wear it, it's a little tender, but it's not too bad. And then sooner or later, you get to where you don't even need it. It doesn't even hurt anymore. Why? Because that skin has hardened up. It's kind of formed like a little callus, and you don't even feel it anymore. Guys, that's how sin is in our life. That's what sin is. It, it, it hardens our hearts so we don't even realize we're doing it. And can I tell you that it can happen to anybody? It can happen to believe. It, it can happen to anybody. I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying, you, should, you know, I'm saying it could happen to anybody. So the enemy's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy you. And he's going to use every opportunity that he can. And, you know, even, even in our, our circle of pastors, as lead pastors, we have to guard against this. Because I can tell you it would be really easy to spend all of our time in the Word, but for studying or for teaching purposes, like to be able to teach you, I mean, that takes a lot of time to prepare. Um, but if I spend all my time, all of our time doing that and not any time on our personal self, that's dangerous, guys. That's dangerous, but it could be easy to do that. It could be easy to get caught up in the business side of church. You know, there is a business side of church. Um, church management, maybe the systems, et cetera, maybe get caught up in counseling people and meeting with people. And then we forget about our personal development. It's easy to do. And I know y'all are probably laughing because you think, pastors, don't you only work two hours on Sunday anyways? I thought I'd get more laughs out of that. We've actually heard that before. <laughs> don't you only work two hours? Is that all you do? No, that's not all we do. I think it's a 24-7 um, responsibility. But you guys may or may not know Bill Hybels. He is a Christian author. He's the founder and pastor of one of the, the biggest churches in North America, 
But he said this, the way that I was doing the work of God destroyed the work of God in me. He said, I got up to pray in front of the church, and I realized that I had not prayed personally all week. He said, I had become a full-time pastor, but a part-time follower of Jesus Christ. Guys, you may or you may not be able to re relate. Maybe you say, well, I'm not a pastor. I don't understand that. But maybe you say, you know what? I'm a full-time parent. I have children at home that I have to care for. I'm a full-time employee. I have a job that I have to go to. Um, may maybe it's that you say, you don't understand. I, I get up early already. I get up early. I, I, I feed the children and, and we get ready for work and I drop them off at school. And then when I, I go to work and I pick them up and then it's homework and bath time and, and on and on and on. We all have responsibilities, right? And then we realize that we haven't had any time for our personal development with God. So we become a full-time parent and a full-time business person or employee, but we become a part-time follower of Jesus. You didn't mean to. You didn't mean to lose your edge or your passion, but you did. You didn't mean to drift from the love and the intimacy that you had with God, and now you feel empty and hollow on the inside, but it happened. You didn't mean to become a part-time follower of Jesus, but you did. And you lost your spiritual edge or your passion. So now, if you ever find yourself in there, let's ask a question. What do I do to get it back? What do I do to get it back? We believe, you know, um, our mission here is to equip people for the journey of life. And we believe that all of our problems, all the answers to all of our problems can be found in the Bible in a relationship with Jesus. So we, I want to take just the next few minutes and go over this, this miracle about the axe head and think about two lessons that we can learn in getting our passion back. So first thing, number one, this lesson is this. We need to be honest about where we lost it. Be honest about where you lost it. Look at verse 6. It says this, The man of God asked, where did it fall? In other words, it was iron. It was going to sink. He knew it couldn't have floated, right? He said, where did it fall? He's saying, it's not gone. It's where you left it. Where did it fall? So this morning, let me ask you, where did you lose it? Where did you start to lose your passion for God and the ways of God? I bet if you look back, I bet you could say, yeah, I remember where now, now that I think about it, I can look back and see how things started changing or I made the wrong turn. And I'll tell you this, many times it's gradual changes because do you know that the devil was crafty? Remember that example of sin? I mean, of the callous, of how it happens over time. Sometimes it's the little things, little after little after little. And then we realize that we're just kind of numb to the Father, you know, maybe you used to be involved in small group and now you're not, or you used to serve, you used to go to church and you're not. And Jesus warns us of this. He says in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. Guys, we need to stay connected with one another. We need each other, our spiritual passion. We need that. Um, maybe you remember how it happened. Maybe you remember when you, you befriended a certain person with different values and, 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 and you ended up doing things that you shouldn't do. Girls, maybe you started dating the wrong guy. Can I, can I tell you what? I, let me share with you what I share with our, with our girls, our children. Don't date for somebody just to date somebody. You need to date to marry. What do I mean by that? You never know when you're going to fall, fall in love with somebody. So make sure that you're, that you're dating somebody with the same values uh, as you. Maybe you remember when you used to get up early, but then you stopped to having your quiet time with him, that discipline. Maybe, maybe somebody in church hurt you, and you just kind of blame God for that. You blame the church for that. Or, or better yet, maybe you blame God for something that happened, and in reality, it was your fault that it happened. It was a consequence of something that you had done. Be honest about where you lost it. Think about it. Where did it start turning around? 
And another lesson that we can learn is this. With God's help, take back what you lost. Take back what you lost. Lift it out. Because, guys, God specializes in helping us find what we didn't mean to lose, right? Look in verses 6 and 7. It says this. When he showed him the place, remember, he knew where he, where he had thrown it, where it had fallen off. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and he threw it there and made the iron float. So that, the miracle in that is that stick became, I guess, like a magnet and drew it to the top. And he said, lift it out. Say that with me. Lift it out. And then the young man reached out his hand and he took it. He had to take it. With God's help, take it back. Take back what you lost. So you remember, we've mentioned it several times now. God can only send the water, but sometimes he's going to ask you to do what? Dig, well, to dig the ditches. That's right. Um, last week, only God could multiply the oil, but he's going to ask you to gather the jars. And today, only God could make the axe head float, and he's asking you to lift it out. And I will tell you that just as soon as you make that, de that declaration, okay, I, I realize where I am and I'm going to do something about it, the enemy is going to put a thought in your head because our enemy is trying to steal, kill, and destroy us. And, and you'll say, I can do this. I, I, can, I want to pursue God again. And the enemy is going to tell you, why are you doing that? God don't care about you. Look what you've done. You know, you, that you're, the latest, that you're the last person God wants um, but that, guys, those are in, that's the enemy. As long as there is breath, there is hope. God is a God of restoration, okay? It's not too late to have what you used to have and get it even more, even more. You hadn't gone too far because God can help you find what you didn't mean to lose. So what does he need for you to do? What does he want us to do? He wants you to go and get whatever he puts within your reach to lift it up, and take it back. So this is what you got to do. You got to do what only you can do. Don't worry about somebody else. Do what you can do and trust God to do what you can't do. So can, can you make that axe head float? No, only God can. But what can you do? You can lift it up, right? You can grab it back. Can in your own spirit, can you create passion by yourself? No, but you can position yourself to, to get to that point. Surround yourself with other believers, play Christian music, um, you know, stay in the Word, pray, do what you can do, and lead the rest to God. Can, can you worship? Can, can, can you worship? Are you going to raise a hallelujah? You can worship even when you don't feel like it. There's two times to worship. When? When you feel like it and when you don't. You can choose to share your faith even when, that's right, that's good stuff. So you can choose to share your faith even when you say, but I don't have all the answers, God. He can use you. He can absolutely use you. Do what you can do and let God do the rest. So the book of Revelation, that is the last book of the Bible. If you look in your Bible, it is literally the last book. It's kind of like reading, and it tells the end times, what's going to happen to the world in the end. It's kind of like reading a, a, a book and, um, and, and skipping to the last chapter to find out how it ends, right? But the last, the chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 through 5 says this. And, and guys, Jesus was talking to the church of Ephesus. He was talking to believers when he said this. And they were doing good things. But this is what he said. Jesus said to the church of Ephesus in verse 4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first. Some translations will say you have forsaken your first love. Consider how far you have fallen. In other words, he's saying, church, you need to wake up. You need to wake up and stop playing church, right? He said, and repent. Turn back. Change directions. Stop your complacency. Turn from your sins. And he says, do the things that you did at first. You see, sometimes there's times in our life when we forget about that, that relationship with Jesus, and it all becomes routine. 
It all becomes, you, you do things out of obligation. Let me check this box. Oh, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to pray. Let me pray. I'm supposed to um, do my devotion. I'm supposed to go to church. You do everything out of, you check the box, but you forget about the why. You forget about that first love, that passion of why you want to do it. It's the difference in relationship and religion. Religion says you have to do this, right? These are the rules. If you, if you don't do this, you're a bad person. Relationship says, I do it because I want to. I do it because I love the Father, and I don't want to disappoint Him. It's kind of like um, when, when we were married, We've been married to this good-looking, young, bald-headed man right here. We've been married 33 years this summer. This is him. <laughs> He's my booger, and I picked him. So <laughs> I told somebody that earlier. <laughs> but anyways, you know, marriage, 33 years of marriage is a long time, guys. And it would be really easy to forget what brought us together to start with. After year after year doing the same thing, doing life together over and over again, it could be real easy to get into a routine and forget about the love, what attracted me to him to start with, okay? That passion, that love. We have to guard against that. Same thing with our relationship, guys, with, with the Lord. We, we, we have to not let it get mundane. We have to, to keep on keeping on. If you want, if you want what you once had, you got to do what you used to do, okay? Because in other words, if God causes it, causes it to float, you got to lift in and get it. you got to do what you can do and trust God to do what He can do. And, you know, I don't know how this applies to you today. You might say, that's kind of a, kind of a different message. It's not where I am. And maybe it's not for you. Maybe it's so that you can take this information and take it to a family member or a friend, or maybe God is preparing you for a time in your life to come when he knows you're going to struggle, and he knows that you need to know the basics. So do what you can do and trust him to do what you can't do. Because guys, our God is a God of restoration, and it doesn't matter where you are or how far you've gone. As long as there is breath, there is hope. And you know, in our scripture today... In our scripture today, this young man, this young student lost something that was very valuable to him. It was very important to him. And to be honest, at the split second that it happened, he may not even thought about the fact that that important thing that he lost is the very thing that helped him accomplish his purpose. Let that sink in. The very thing that he lost is the very thing that would help him accomplish his purpose. It was needed. So why did he even have an ax head to start with? You remember? He was building the school, right? He was building a new building, a bigger, a bigger school. And when he lost the cutting edge, when he lost that, could he cut down trees anymore? Sometimes when we get to a place and we feel like we've lost our passion and you're just kind of drifting, you're just kind of same old, same old, doing what I do is what I'm supposed to do. It's really hard for God to help you fulfill your purpose without that passion. But you know what the win in all this story is? Is that this young man realized it. He realized it when he lost this important thing Uh, He responded, he cried out in such a way. God heard him. And he miraculously made it float to the top of the water where he could get it back. And he lifted it out. So he chose to go get it back, right? It could have just floated there. It could just stayed floating. Would it have done this young student any good if he didn't go get it? No. He had to take the initiative to make the choice to obey what Elisha said when he said, go get it. And you know, so many of the promises of God are conditional, guys. So many of the promises that we like to declare in our lives are, if you do this, God says, then I will do that. Okay? If you want water, if you need water, then first you got to go dig the ditches. You know, if you need provisions to pay your debt, 
first go get your empty jars and bring them to me and then I will fill them up and you can pay off your debts. Okay, think about the walls of Jericho that we study in the book of Joshua. You remember that story, the walls of Jericho? God said to Joshua, you're going to have the victory of Jericho. You're going you're gonna to get that city. But it didn't happen until he obeyed what God told him to do. God told him to, you know the story, to march around, the army to march around um, one time for six days and on that seventh day to march around seven times. Can you imagine how crazy they felt doing that? But they had to obey God and then they saw the victory. You know, think about Abraham. God called Abraham. He said, he said I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you a, a father of many nations. You're going to have a great nation. You remember that st- the, the little song, The Father of Abraham? But he said, before you do that, before I do that, I just need you to go. You just need to take your family and go. And Abraham basically, in my words, is where you want me to go. And God said, I'll show you. Just trust me. So guys, that took ridiculous faith for Abraham just to take his family and to go to to where God was going to lead him. And do you know that he was 75 years old? Guys, don't tell me he's ever too old to serve the Lord. You're never too old to serve the Lord. Think about Proverbs. There's a, a, a scripture in Proverbs that says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all of your crops. He's talking about our income. And then it says, and then the barns will be running over. In other words, God's saying, you've got to trust me first. You've got to believe that I am for you. I'm not against you. You've got to believe that I will provide for you. I'm God, your provider. So he asks us to tithe first, not knowing how, how, Lord, I can't even pay my bills now. But he says, trust me on this. My 90% is way more than the world's 100%. Okay? These are different little things. And I could go on and on. I could go on and on about how God asked us to have ridiculous faith, extravagant faith, faith that doesn't always make sense. God is asking us to trust Him this morning. Will you guys stand with me? Will you guys stand? You know, I believe that just like in in the story that we read, that God stirred the water. He stirred the water and He brought what was needed to surface. I believe the Holy Spirit might just be stirring in some people this morning in their heart, stirring the water of your life and kind of bringing to surface. You know, it's real easy to be deceived, isn't it? The enemy is is a liar. He's a deceiver. It's easy to be blinded. And sometimes it's even hard for us to see that that we need more passion for God because the enemy has told us it's okay. But if you realize you've lost your passion to God, what can you do? Just like that young student, you can cry out. And then when he provides it, you can lift it back. You can lift it out, lift it out. If you found out that you've, you know, if you realize that you've lost your faith and joy in God, you need to go get it. You got to do what only you can do and then let God do the rest. Or if you realize that you've lost or find yourself in a season where you've lost your, your passion or your joy, remember how it was in the beginning. You know, your first love. You have to, you got to lift it out. You got to do something about it. So, you know, if, you, if you're here this morning and you say this simple story has got me thinking, have I lost my passion? Do I need more of God? If, if you feel like that's you, will you raise your hand this morning? Is there anybody brave enough this morning to say, this is where I am and this is what I need to do? So we want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. I see them all over. Thank you. God sees you. He sees you. And He wants you to remember your first love. You might be here today or you might be listening online and you said, well, I don't even remember what that's like. I've I've never even had the peace and joy of God. I don't know what it's like that, that He forgave me my sins and lifted the bondages in my life and gave me victory. 
because I've never had a relationship with Him. That might be you this morning. And you might say, well, what do I need to do? You know how we do it each week, the ABCs. A, you got to admit that you're a sinner. In all of our issues and problems, we have to admit our problems so that we can know what to do. We have to admit that we're a sinner in need of God's grace and we need forgiveness. And B, you got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died on this cross for you and me to save us of our sins. And C, you got to confess Him as Lord and Savior in your life. And then D, do something about it. You've got to lift it out, right? You've got to make that choice. Is there anybody here this morning that says, that's me. I need Jesus in my life. I don't know Him. We cannot leave today without giving you that opportunity. Will you guys pray with me? God, we thank You, Father. We thank You for this, this Word, as simple as it might be, God. I pray that You will speak to us, God. And I know that Your Word does not come back void, God. So You've spoken into somebody's life this morning. God, I pray for passion. God, I pray for a love for you, a zeal. I pray, God, that you set a fire in our lives. God, I pray that we care more about what the Word says than what the world says, God. I pray that you stir in our lives. God, like we sang this morning, rest on us. Holy Spirit, we invite you into our lives to guide and direct us, Lord. Convict us when we do wrong. Guide us and direct us. Provide for us, God. We thank you. And God, if there be somebody here this morning who doesn't know you, and God, for the first time, they want to ask you into their life, God, and their lives will forever be changed. And I thank you for that, God. And I pray that as a church family, God, that we can gather together and to help one another, God, and to, to strengthen one another, Lord. And, and God, we just love you and we thank you. And we ask these things in your mighty name, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for coming today and worshiping with us. And hopefully this simple message will have spoken to you in some form or fashion. Um, once again, if you made a decision, come see us. We're down front. We have some resources for you. Um, if it's a first-time guest, make sure you see the tent out there and, uh, and get your gift. And we will just, uh, y'all have a good week. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Every new sun rises one step closer